Hello everyone, it's Pastor Steve Miller from Jesus is the Gate Christian Ministry here in beautiful Glen Arm, Illinois. Uh, we're glad you're here to join us. Thanks for tuning in to YouTube today. Uh, it is the last Sunday of 2020. It is the last Sunday that represents the beginning and hopefully the end of COVID-19. And uh, I'm sure you'll agree with me like most that we're really happy that, that 2020 will be, be behind us uh, very, very soon. And uh, 2021 is awaiting for us just around the corner. In fact, five more days. Uh, here we are on Sunday, January the 27th, bringing you a virtual a broadcast earlier of our worship and now uh, the message for today that I wanna bring you. So I've been praying about this, is what, what is the message that God wants me to teach on today? And when I think about us all approaching 2021, uh, it's so important that we do this with the mind of Christ and that we do this with a positive attitude. And uh, that's something to be said and difficult to do these days. So many people uh, have so many reasons um, to be cynical, to be negative, um, to be upset, to be sad, to be depressed, uh, all of that. But, you know, in the Lord's word, in God's word, in the Bible, he says that in Psalms 23, 7, he says, as a man thinks in his heart, so he is. Abundant life begins uh, with a positive attitude. So I want to talk about a positive attitude, something easy to say, but a little more difficult to do. But the reality is today, the message is, is that we do have a choice. And we wanna give you some ideas of how we can accomplish that today in the short time that we have together. Um, no matter what we face today, God's promises stand true, amen? In hard seasons, it may seem easier to complain about everything uh, than to offer God praise. But there is a great power in choosing to set our hearts and mind on Christ, offering him praise for who he is and how he's at work in our lives. And yes, he is. He redeems us from the pit. He satisfies us with good things and reviews us, remembering God's promises and choosing to praise him and trust his sovereignty, his awesome power is the first step towards finding hope in the hard seasons. I can remember back in my early 20s when I was trying to find out who I was and where I was going and how to be successful. I remember um, ordering some tapes um, that you would list to most, listen to motivational speakers. And there was one in particular that I listened to. His name was Brian Tracy. And Brian's whole concept was, in, in my opinion, although he didn't quote um, the uh, Proverbs 23, 7, uh, as a man thinks in his heart, so he is. He did have a saying that says that we become what we believe we are becoming. And meaning, if you do have a positive view of yourself and of your life and of your future and the hope of glory in Jesus Christ, you will accomplish great things. And that we have to believe positive and stay away from the negative, stay away from the dark side and be focused on the light. And that is the light of Jesus Christ. I want to... Uh, to, to remind you, and I'm going to be uh, showing some slides here today, but I, uh, I want to, in particular, uh, talk about the biblical reference about uh, our attitude and, and some examples in Scripture that uh, lead us in the right direction here as we go. Uh, what is an attitude? And it is the advanced man of our true selves. It's our future of us when we have an attitude about the future. Its roots are inward, but its fruit is outward. It is our best friend, but also could be our worst enemy. We're talking about your attitude. It is more honest and more consistent than our words. It is an outward look based on our past experiences. It is a thing that draws people to us or repels them. It is never content until it is expressed. It is the librarian or the historical repository of our past. 
It is the speaker of our present. And finally, it is the prophet of our future. We're talking about our attitude. It's a big part of who we are and how we approach the things of God. And really, it becomes the foundation of us achieving a biblical perspective of this world we live in, as opposed to a worldly view. So I want to take a look uh, briefly at some relative scripture here, and we'll do that actually in the book of Numbers. Um, and a lot of you are very familiar with this scripture, uh, which talks specifically about uh, Joshua and Caleb. And you remember the story of the spies that were spent, sent to, uh, to, to Canaan. So I'm going to look at uh, Numbers 13, 1 through 3, if you want to join me in your Bible there. The Lord now said to Moses, send out men to explore the land of Canaan. The land I am giving to the Israelites. Send one leader from each of the 12 ancestral tribes. So Moses did as the Lord commanded him. He sent out 12 men, all tribal leaders of Israel, from their camp in the wilderness of Paran. In verse 17. Moses gave the men these instructions as he sent them out to explore the land. Go north through the Negev into the hill country. See what the land is like and find out whether the people living there are strong or weak, few or many. See what kind of land they live in. Is it good or bad? Do their towns have walls or are they unprotected like open camps? Is the soil fertile or poor? Are there many trees? Do your best to bring back samples of the crops you see. It happens to be the season for the harvesting of the first ripe grapes. So they went up and explored the land from the wilderness of Zen as far as Rehob near Labahab. Going north, they passed through the Negev and arrived at Hebron where Anaman, Shisha, and Talmai, all descendants of Anak, lived. The ancient town of Hebron was founded seven years before the Egyptian city of Zoan. When they came to the valley of Eskol, they cut down a branch with a single cluster of grapes so large that it took two men to actually carry it on a pole between them. They also brought back samples of the pomegranates and figs. Can you imagine that? Uh, it takes two men to carry uh, a bunch of grapes. That's crazy. That place where they found these, this amazing fruit, that place was called the Valley of Eshkol, which means cluster, because of the cluster of graves that the Israelite men cut there. The scouting report was as follows. After exploring the land for 40 days, the men returned to Moses, Aaron, and the whole community of Israel at Kadesh in the wilderness of Paran. They reported to the whole community that they had been seen and showed them the fruit they had taken from the land. This was their report to Moses. We entered the land you sent us to explore, and it is indeed a bountiful country. A land flowing with milk and honey. Here's the kind of fruit it produces. But the people living there are powerful, they said, and their towns are large and fortified. We even saw giants there, the descendants of the Anak. The Amalekites live in the Negev, and the Hittites, Jebusites, and the Amorites live in the hill country. The Canaanites live along the coast of the Mediterranean Sea and along the Jordan Valley. But Caleb tried to quiet the people as they stood before Moses. Let's go at once to take the land, he said. We can certainly conquer it. But the other men who had explored the land with him disagreed. We can't go up against them. They are stronger than we are. So they spread this bad report among the land, among the Israelites. The land we traveled through and explored will devour anyone who goes to live there. All the people we saw were huge. We even saw giants there and the descendants of Anak. Next to them, we felt like grasshoppers. And that's what they thought. Two. In verse 14, then the whole community began weeping aloud and cried all night. Their voices rose in a great chorus of protest against Moses and Aaron. 
If only we had died in Egypt or even here in the wilderness, they complain. Why is the Lord taking us to this country only to have us die in battle? Our wives and our little ones will be carried off as plundered. Wouldn't it be better for us just to return to Egypt? Then they plotted among themselves. Let's choose a new leader and go back to Egypt. Then Moses and Aaron fell face down on the ground before the whole community of Israel. Two of the men who had explored the land, Joshua, son of Nun, and Caleb, son of Jephunneh, tore their clothing. They said to all the people of Israel, the land that we traveled through and explored is a wonderful land. And if the Lord is pleased with us, he will bring us safely into the land and give it to us. It is a rich land flowing with milk and honey. Do not rebel against the Lord and don't be afraid of the people of the land. They are only helpless prey to us. They have no protection, but the Lord is with us. Don't be afraid of that. Thank you, Jesus. So we have a couple of uh, contrasting thoughts there of the spies who went to the land of milk and honey. And we can see comparatively here that the attitude, my attitude as I begin to task will affect its outcome more than anything else. And so when we see uh, the attitude on the left of Joshua and Caleb versus the other 10 spies, what a contrast here. And it's all about their attitude and their perspective. So we see that Joshua and Caleb here saw the fruit in the land um, compared to the other 10 spies. They saw a problem in the land. And Joshua and Caleb saw themselves in God's hands while the other 10 spies saw themselves as small and weak. We see in a positive aspect that Joshua and Caleb were optimistic about the future. In contrast, the 10 spies were pessimistic about the future. And finally, Joshua and Caleb were encouraged stepping out into faith while the rest of them prevented the people from progress. Hmm. It's all about our perspective. It's all about our attitude. And it's good to know that our attitude towards others determines their attitude towards us, right? So how we perceive others, how they interpret that is really how they view us as humans. And that's a great story, right? And, you know, I see that the other 10 spies, they had reason to fear. They had reason um, to be afraid, to be suspicious, uh, to think that they were bound for, uh, for failure and destruction. Uh, and yet, um, Caleb and Joshua, they had the mind of Christ here in this situation. And they were strong and courageous, not by their might, but by the Lord's might. And uh, through their faith, they were going to be conquerors. Amen. So we reap what we sow. Um, and we must always reflect Jesus' love towards others, especially now through this pandemic. Uh, that's so important. You know, the attitudes... The attitudes is really the major difference between success and failure in so many things we do. So how we approach 2021, we need to be thinking about that and praying about that, that we must have the mind of Christ as we approach um, this coming year. Three phases of a problem that we run into. First phase of, of, of a problem is really identification or the awareness uh, that we in fact do have a problem. The second thing, almost instantaneously, we do an evaluation, right? Of what went wrong, and defining the problem and what it is. And finally, we think about the choice that we have. And that choice, um, that choice is, this is where attitude really comes into play and steps in. Um, Jeremiah 32, 17. Ah, oh, Lord God, behold, you have made the heavens and the earth by your great power and by your outstretched arm. Nothing is too difficult for you, Lord. Uh, God often reminds us that he is greater than the problem, greater than the obstacle. 
the giant uh, that we face and the fear. He is God of miracles, right? A God of miracles who works on our behalf um, of his children, even where we can't fully see it, right? When confident of this truth, when we're confident in uh, the sovereignty of God, we can fully trust him. We may not understand it on, uh, fully on this side of heaven, but God is always faithful. And he can do in just a moment what it might take years for us to work through on our own. Yes, God can do it in the blink of an eye where it can take us a lifetime to solve some of these problems. Amen. God's power is still greater than the works of darkness and far stronger than anything we may face here on earth. My attitude, my attitude can turn my problems into blessings. 2 Corinthians 12, 9 through 10. But he said to me, my grace is sufficient for you, for my power is made perfect in weakness. Therefore, I will boast all the more gladly about my weaknesses, so that Christ's power may rest on me. That is why, for Christ's sake, I delight in weaknesses, insults, and in hardship, in persecutions, in difficulties. For when I am weak, there I am strong. Amen. It's certainly never easy, but the truth is our greatest growth and perseverance um, coming from these hard seasons that we go through. Through hard places, God brings us to deeper humility and dependency upon him. I do believe that that's part of his purpose. Folks often ask me, you know, why is there suffering? And I believe that God is always, you know, he, he's in the middle of everything and that he has a purpose and um, he has, he's always teaching, always teaching us through these storms, um, ultimately to do a work in us and those around us. Amen. We can find great joy and be able to confidently say what Paul proclaimed in these verses. When I am weak, then I am strong. It is the truest lesson of learning less of me and more of him. And it yields the abundant fruit from the life hidden in Christ. Our attitudes are shaped and influenced by life experiences. Um, I know there's been a lot of things that have happened in my life and yours as well that have really changed and um, defined who I am and who you are today through those experiences. You know, one of the biggest things I think that I had to learn at um, a relatively young age is understanding the fragility, uh, how fragile uh, life is, and having an appreciation for every breath that God has given us. Um, and it's really the foundation um, of a biblical view built on the rock of Jesus Christ. Amen. Moreover, God in Christ Jesus is the rock of our salvation and the promise for everlasting life. When I think about, you know, when you're a young kid um, in elementary school and then middle school, grade school, um, you know, it's like we're going to live forever. And we really, uh, unless somebody, you know, maybe you lose a family member, a, a great grandma first, and maybe a grandma or a grandfather, and those kind of family tragedies, uh, all of us eventually do experience. Um, but we have our parents with us usually at that age uh, to carry us and usher us through those valleys that we're going through and explain things to it. But it's the unusual things that happen in life, I think, that really have a significant impact on our attitudes and our perspectives. And I know I think of mine like in 1968, I remember, I think it was the summer of uh, right before I went into high school and I got notice, uh, came home from school, and my mother had told me that um, a young boy that was like three years younger than me uh, had gotten hit on his bicycle. He was riding it out in the country, came over a hill, he was on the wrong side of the road, and he got hit by a car, and he was killed instantly. That was traumatic for me, understanding that, that you know, here's a boy that I knew and uh, in school, and that the next day he was not gonna be in school. 
and um, there was a, uh, a significant learning experience for some tragedy like that. But probably the biggest one in my life was back in July um, of 1971. I actually was getting ready to go into my senior year of high school and it was in the summertime and you know we were all having fun doing our things in the summertime and um, I actually uh, woke up the next morning and uh, my brother came in my room and told me that there was a terrible tragedy last night on Saturday night and he indicated that four teenagers uh, in my high school uh, in my school uh, were tragically killed and uh, they were about four miles south of, of Rushville in Schuyler County in a Volkswagen and a drunken driver came um, from the southbound lane into their lane the northbound lane and hit them head on and it was um, actually three vehicles that got involved in the accident. And it was the second vehicle that hit them that caused the gas tank in a Volkswagen uh, to explode. And the entire car was engulfed with flames and all four of those wonderful kids uh, were killed on that day in, in 1971. It just, I mean, our whole community stood still for a moment. It was a massive tragedy affecting schools, affecting the whole community, and affecting everyone's perspective on life, and really growing and learning and appreciation for everyone's uh, mortality. Uh, that a lot of times, you know, we go every day thinking that everything's wonderful and, and we're gonna live forever, but we found out that day it's not true. And um, it was a terrible tragedy that impacted me for a lifetime. And then later on, you know, um, uh, I lived in the sheriff's office with my father, who was the sheriff. This is prior to Louie and I getting married. And um, uh, we had so many situations that were learning experiences for me. I remember my father hadn't even been in office uh, two months, and he woke me up in the middle of the night. We actually lived in the jail upstairs, and, and he said, come on, let's go. I need somebody with me. And I said, okay. And, um, I was probably, I was 17, I believe at the time. And he uh, grabbed me and we went to the scene of a crime uh, of a potential homicide. And it was just uh, not too many blocks from the sheriff's office and walked in there and, and a young man lay on the floor that wasn't a couple of years older than I was and had been stabbed to death. And just seeing those things live for the first time uh, had a tremendous uh, impact on me. And uh, I think a lot of that, um, and I've told the story many times about, you know, going to uh, the scene of a drowning, that my father and I were the first ones on the scene of a possible drowning, where ultimately we discovered that a young boy my age had went in the water, and then um, uh, he went under, and then his father followed him and uh, uh, to try to save his son, and then he drowned also. And my father and I both had to pull uh, them out of the water, and, and I actually was the one who brought the young boy up um, that was lifeless. And at that point, you know, my attitude, my perspective on life changed um, forever. And understanding, uh, I think from then, it was instilled in my DNA of the desire to help people, uh, understanding that it's we're not going to live forever and um, it's important what we do today um, and tomorrow and uh, and make a difference in our life and and to be positive about it and then I joined the Illinois State Police and, and then it was a, a waterfall a flood of incidents that I was dealing with every day you know from tragic fatality accidents uh, to I was working and a trooper got shot and he called me on the radio. Um, I uh, with suicide situations, hostage situations, um, uh, troopers being killed. I remember a massive incident on I-57 uh, over uh, by Champaign when I was working and uh, on a traffic stop, uh, five people were murdered at the scene of this traffic stop, two of them being police officers and um, the whole state was on alert then at that time. But living and working in public safety and as a first responder and all of that, um, it changes your perspective. And there's a seriousness about all of that 
and yet you try to maintain your sense of humor. You have a choice of how you deal with these things in life. And um, I, choose, I choose Christ. And I choose uh, to take a positive attitude towards all of that. I'm not perfect all the time, but that's something that's so important. The point here is that we want to, uh, we are shaped, all of us, every one of us here, by uh, your experiences in life. My attitude can give me an uncommon positive perspective on life. In Mark 9, 23, all things are possible to him who believes. And we know that all things God works for, the good of those who love him, who have been called according to his purpose. Romans 8, 28, I know that's Alexis's favorite scripture and probably most of our people in the audience today. As believers in Christ, we can hold fast to this promise. You know, God will never waste our pain. He will turn it around for good. Every battle, every painful storm, he will never allow us to walk through deep struggle without allowing us to bring greater hope and purpose, both in our own lives, through our place in this world. Every mark of darkness is redeemed when we're in Jesus Christ. It's what he does best. He brings beauty and strength, hope and goodness from every difficult journey and broken day. Our Lord lifts us out of the deep and into greater purpose and blessings up ahead. Restored, redeemed, renewed, and repurposed from every situation. My attitude is my best friend or my worst enemy of life. If we've lived long enough, we know this to be true. The trials we face are all part of life. None of us are immune from hard times. You know, I've always talked about the three kinds of people. There's people, uh, that are in the middle of crisis, of tragedy, of suffering. And then there's people that are just coming out of crisis and devastation and tragedy. And then there's people that are just getting ready to enter in crisis, devastation, and tragedy. He tells us not to be surprised at the troubles we face, but to keep on rejoicing. I've needed to let that sink deep in again. Keep on rejoicing. Because truly it is a choice of rejoicing. It may be hard to keep choosing joy when life seems to press us down. But God wants to lift our burdens and remind us that there's hope still ahead. My attitude, not my achievements, will give me happiness. Ephesians 2.11, but as I looked at everything I had worked on so hard to accomplish, it was all so meaningless, like chasing the wind. There was nothing really worthwhile anywhere. It's Ecclesiastes 2.11. And in chapter 3, 12 through 13, so I concluded there is nothing better than to be happy and enjoy ourselves as long as we can. And people should eat and drink and enjoy the fruits of their labor, for these are the gifts of God. It's from King Solomon. Right. My attitude will change when I choose to change it. We are in control. God is in control. As you mature, life is governed by, uh, governed more uh, by your choices and uh, much more than your conditions uh, or circumstances. The enemy will always tempt us to believe we are forgotten and left on our own. We have to make the choice to step right over uh, his traps that he makes for us. We may not be aware, but God is leading, carrying us, even when we don't understand how we're getting through each day. The Bible is filled with countless reminders that he loves us and that his presence covers us, goes before us, and hymns us in 
from behind. God never asks us to face the struggles alone. John Maxwell, a um, you know, pretty famous uh, Christian pastor, uh, Louisiana, and actually stopped by his church out in Southern California, um, guys, 20 years ago. A quote from John, he says, the air currents of life jolt us out of line and try to keep us from achieving our goals. Unexpected weather can change our direction and strategy. We must adjust our thinking continually as we can live right. So it's a dynamic thing, our attitude, right? And our response to every situation based upon circumstances, based upon situation, based upon the day, based upon the valley, based upon the mountaintop that we're going through as we adjust and make choices to be positive, um, to invite Jesus, Holy Spirit, into every decision that we make and everything that we do. My attitude needs continual adjustment and indicators that tell you that your attitude may need some adjustment are these. Number one, I have not had enough time with God or myself. That's a good indicator that uh, your attitude may need some attention. Number two, my family notices and tells me about my attitude. Number three, my relationship with coworkers or friends becomes strained. Number four, my view of people begins to lower. And number five, my perspective on life becomes cynical and negative. Psalms 46, 10, which I talk about a lot, and that is to be still and know that he is God. One of the hardest things I've learned in life, especially in tough times, is simply this, to be still. To be still and listen. More of that, more God. When we're so prone to hurry and worry, this can be such a challenge. But we should never allow the pressures of what we're facing get in the way of just spending much needed time in God's presence. It's truly the most important minute of our day and will bring peace to our spirit and strength to the day to be still and know that he is God. Whatever's concerning you, entrust it to our powerful God. Talk to him. He knows your burdens and he cares. Read his word and pray them back to him. Think about them day and night. Time spent with God helps us to quit spiraling into cycles of worry. As our hearts and minds focus more on him, the very God who causes the sun to rise every morning, who created us and all that we see, also keeps us safe in his care and reminds us he hasn't lost control. Not ever. My attitude is contagious and yours can be too. People catch our attitudes like they catch a cold from us by getting too close to us. That's so important to think that you have the power of influence to take your positive attitude and reflect it and project it on the world and on others, on your friends, on your enemies, on your coworkers, on your loved ones, on your family. Yes, it's called being Jesus to others. I want my faith in Christ Jesus to be contagious. Imagine just like this pandemic of COVID-19, if everyone that we come into close contact with would catch Jesus from us, that would be a wonderful thing. Mm. The choice of attitude, Jesus, is a daily, hourly, and by the minute decision that we always have to make. And these choices will have external consequences. When we find ourselves there in the storm, it's easy to start thinking it may never end. But we're not meant to stay stuck there. This is only a season of time. God promises to see us through and he will help us step through to the other side of the struggle. Job 23.10, what a great example. But he knows the way that I take. 
When he has tested me, I will come forth as gold. He knows our way and he is building beauty and strength. He promises he will come out as gold, tested, tried, and true. Remember that you're only passing through here. We will be changed for the better, stronger, shining, beautiful, deepened from within by the power of Christ. So what are the top 10 reasons why we can have hope and a positive attitude for Jesus. Number one, God forgives and redeems. Amen. We are not defined by our past. God set us free from all of that. He's washed all that away. He is bigger than our battle. God's power is made perfect in our weakness. God will bring purpose through this trial and we'll turn it around for good. He reminds us to choose joy. Amen. God covers us in his care. God is in control so we don't have to worry. God knows our way and he is carrying us through. God gives us his grace and mercy for each new day. Hallelujah. Lamentations 3, 22 through 23. The steadfast love of the Lord never ceases. His mercies never come to an end. They are new every morning. Great is your faithfulness. I love that. That every morning we get new mercies. Hallelujah. What does it mean? You know, what does it mean that God's mercies are new every morning. Let's boil that down just a little bit. God reminds us of this powerful promise in his word that offers peace to our hearts in hard seasons. It was written for his people when times were very difficult. It gives us great hope in the battles we face today, like rays of light breaking through the darkest night. For just as sure as the sun comes up every morning, we can be confident that his mercies never end. They are never based on how good we are, but only on his steadfast character. His compassion towards us is fresh every morning, and each day is a gift straight from his hand. We can trust his heart for us. And every single morning, God is waiting to meet with us, with the fresh filling of his Holy Spirit, with strength for the day ahead. He offers us the rich blessing of his grace and mercy that never runs dry. Thank you, Lord. And I'm incredibly thankful for both. I'm sure you are too. God is so good, always gracious and loving. As you draw near to him today, May you sense his powerful presence surrounding you in, in every way. Thank you for your grace, Father. Thank you for your mercy. You, uh, you see the definitions there of grace is really getting, getting uh, what we don't deserve. And mercy huh, is not getting what we do deserve. During this COVID season, guys, the days can feel weary and life can be hard. Circumstances might change around us, but we find ourselves facing huge battles. Perhaps we're walking through a difficult illness or a dark seasons, and no matter how much we pray, the difficulty seems to linger on for far too long. I just uh, want to take time out tonight, today, to just encourage all of you and remind all of you that Jesus is on your side and that as we put our trust in him, uh, he will see us through. And you do have a choice. Um, we have a choice, you know, if you feel like you're surrounded by, by people, by humans, 
that are not positive, people that are cynical, people that are negative, um, you do have a choice. You have a choice um, to love on them. You have a choice to um, encourage them, uh, to give them a positive perspective, a Jesus perspective, if you will. Uh, but at some time, if it becomes overwhelming, you have an opportunity and a choice to go the other direction, right? And sometimes in those toxic relationships, that's exactly what uh, Jesus wants us to do. We do always need to take the opportunity to influence and testify and share the gospel uh, with those folks. Um, but at some point, uh, if it's being toxic to you, um, that you need to go the other direction. You know, I, I want to pray here in a moment to pray us out of here, but I think it's so important that uh, when we talk about the choices that we make, there's a, uh, you know, Joshua 24, 15, it says, but as for me and my house, I will serve the Lord. Joshua used his wisdom and love of God to set the example. And he declares, as for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. Joshua was determined to serve God no matter what anyone else thought. Well, I'm asking you to do that today. And from now on, as we approach 2021, to put your faith and your trust in our creator, um, in Jesus, um, to share the gospel every chance you get, but do it with a smile on your face. Choose to smile. Choose to be love. Choose to be Jesus to everyone that you encounter. Um, we just love you. We look forward to seeing you again in person very soon in 2021. If you could there at home, just bow your heads right now and let's just pray tonight. Dear God, we pray that you would give us a heart today to seek you above all else. Thank you that your mercies are new every morning, Father. Thank you that your faithfulness is greater than we could ever imagine. We choose to maintain an attitude of joy, Father, and strengthen you today. And we trust you to bring us through this dark season stronger, restored, shining like gold with greater purpose for the road ahead in 2021. Hey, we love you. Thank you for joining us today. Uh, be blessed this week, and we'll see you next weekend on YouTube and soon in person. Be blessed, hallelujah, and have a great day. In Jesus' name, amen.